From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Here's where it gets crazy. Let's talk about body brokers. How does how does this grieving family actually get past this tragedy? What makes them sometimes donate to science? And uh, after they do that donation, however they see it happening, how does it get to those institutions? Yeah, uh, several times on this show and a couple other ones, we've talked about resurrection men back in the day who would acquire bodies. Because there was a bit of an issue there where it was legal to experiment on a dead body, but it was illegal to, you know, go to a graveyard and dig up a dead body or to acquire a dead body from the morgue or a recently deceased human being. Um, and we're entering a weird gray area here where we have been for many, many years where there's, there's really a, a price loophole, honestly that has created an entire new market for dead bodies and people are resurrecting resurrection men. Mm -hmm. Just so. Yeah. Because the resurrection men idea came about due to a odd legal loophole. Uh, several centuries ago, it was absolutely legal to experiment on dead bodies, medical researchers, doctors, and so on surgeons, anatomists, but it was generally illegal to procure them, kind of like some of those drug laws that say possession of marijuana is okay, but buying it is a big no-no. So this gray market slash illegal market of resurrection men arose, and they were body snatchers. You can argue, just like we did, Matt, that resurrection men have been resurrected. Body brokers, who don't like the name body brokers, by the way, uh, they'll, they'll prefer the term non-transplant tissue banks, buy and sell human body parts or entire corpses. And wait, you might be saying, buy, sell? How can they get away with that? Didn't you just say this was illegal? Well, here's the thing. In the U.S. and several other countries, the organ transplant trade is heavily regulated, in theory. Shout out to our other episode on the red market. But you may be surprised to learn, Uncle Sam does not, has never, regulated the use of human body parts in research, training, and so on. So it's kind of like, if you think of a human body like a car, it's kind of like you, you do have to have some paperwork and accountability when you're selling certain pieces of the car. But if you just sell the whole car or you just sell these pieces that don't qualify, you know, as organs, then do what you want. You literally have to have yes, no I qualification. I guess I imagine they figure they've already ticked the box for that regulation by overseeing the procurement stage. And then as long as they go through the right channels to get them to the research institutions, then go with God at that point. Um, I'm sure you guys found it as well. There's only one state I know of that keeps detailed records on the industry, and that is the state of New York. Uh, they looked at numbers that went from 2011, 2014, uh, and found that companies doing business in New York, not necessarily based there, but doing business there, shipped at least 100,000 body parts across the entire country over the course of three years. And that's a weird number, especially when you reference it to the idea that um, only the Harvard or Harvard professor pal says only 20,000 were shipped across the U.S. all in all. Right. So it seems like there's a lot of disturbing variance in the estimates. But think about it right now. As macabre as it sounds. Whatever you do, whatever your qualifications are, if you happen to have a box of heads or a hand of glory and you didn't get it through the commission of a crime, you can sell it. You can like go online just start a Squarespace or something. I don't think they want that association. Uh, but you could just start a website and sell this stuff, and it's absolutely legal. Surely there's some way to uh, 
to document chain of custody. I mean, it's going to take your word for it that you didn't get this hand from the commission of a crime. Right. Yeah. So this this is a good question, though, because uh, so the issue on the table then is that it, the onus of responsibility often falls upon the medical institutions accepting the accepting the remains. So they have their own internal standards, which can vary from one place to the next, su such that they can say, look, this this doesn't seem right to us. Well, we can't we can't accept this in good faith. It, it reminds me of the argument you often hear about, like campaign donations, where it's like, well, you don't care where it came from. That's not our job. But, but like it is their job uh, in some respect. And it definitely is the job of the medical institutions. But it could also be an argument they make where, oh, everything seemed on the up and up. Just turns out it was actually uh, from something completely uh, illegitimate. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's passing the buck of accountability, right? There's a lot of not my jobism in some of these things, especially when you get to the um, non transplant tissue banks or body brokers. The Reuters thing that Matt and I are referring to is an excellent deep dive series, uh, multi part, and we're going to pull uh, from that several times today. One of the first things I like to pull from there is a quote from. Angela MacArthur. So this series, this quote was from 2017, but the series uh, goes back a few years. Uh, Angela MacArthur at the time was the director of the body donation program at University of Minnesota Medical School. She was also once upon a time, the chairperson of the state's anatomical donation commission. So in other words, a world-class expert. And what she had to say was not pretty and it is not nuanced. It is a clear statement of a problem. She says, quote, the current state of affairs is a free for all. We're seeing similar problems to what we saw with grave robbers centuries ago. Uh, and then she continued, I don't know if I can state this strongly enough. What they, meaning body brokers, are doing is profiting from the sale of humans. Wow. Strong. It's a lot of money to be made. And, you know, there's there's some frankly offensive stuff, too, about this when you look at the price per body, you know, because that's what they're doing. They're putting a price on on human remains. And ben, you've mentioned like the bodies exhibit oftentimes uh, as uh, the provenance of those cadavers being sketchy at best. Yeah, yeah. And that's um, the bodies exhibit. Unfortunately, those uh, corpses were. Often likely taken from prisoners who did not have informed consent and their family didn't either. Uh, but yet, yeah, Matt, if you want to go into the price of a body on a yeah. body broker market, let's, let's get into it. Yeah. Let's, let's quickly do that. According to the 2017 investigation by Reuters titled the body trade, you can find it Reuters.com. They found that a body broker or a human tissue trader uh could sell a single human body for somewhere between three thousand to five thousand dollars so that's like a uh a whole human body yeah. you could also cut that body up and mm -hmm. get part price per part which is where it gets right. really crazy do you get more in totality if you're selling individual parts than you would as a whole body you yes. can it's chop shop rules uh i would think you would yeah i found Thanks. um because I, I was digging in because it was hard to find the numbers here. So I, I, I also looked at the Reuters stuff and then I went to um, a source in FDA from 2021 and their estimate was a little bit higher. And I think I know why. So they said in general, you're looking at around $5,000 for a whole mm -hmm. body. They said prices sometimes top $10,000 because body parts like may fit certain specifications. Mm -hmm. Like we want to look at this medical condition and to make it even more ghoulish. That's if you sell those parts, body brokers don't always sell the parts. Sometimes they rent it. Sometimes they lease it what? and they yeah. get it back. Yeah. Yeah. Depending on How what you need it for. Possible? Well, in that Reuters article, there's an example in 2013 of a shipment to a quote, Florida orthopedic training seminar an orthopedic training seminar that included 27 shoulders. Now I can imagine if that training seminar needs just the specific shoulder 
for, you know, however many hours that's going to be. Theoretically, as grisly as it is, you could then ice, put that shoulder back on ice or those 27 shoulders and then ship it back to the company. Or imagine it's to demonstrate a medical device of some kind. That could happen too, or to train um, to train EMTs, for instance, in resuscitation. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, surgeons also, uh, surgeons. I I think I put this somewhere else in here, but surgeons also have um, routinely said that three D modeling or mannequins or simulations is not like the real thing, and that to do their jobs well, they need to practice on actual bodies in a way that does not risk injuring people while they're you know earning their surgeon stripes this is um this is weird because there is clearly a need but oh and i also need to point out that source i mentioned earlier is in fda is the national funeral directors association mm. and they're they're making a lot of moves actually in favor of reining in the body broker trade so kudos to them but so the issue here is that there is a ton of money to be made we talked about it right especially considering that sometimes body brokers or these banks can function as libraries lending out components of what was once a human being they can make a lot of money but they're making it without the informed consent of a deceased person's family often in very misleading ways and of course the deceased person's family is not receiving any compensation for this, that would be illegal. And one thing that's important to recognize about the way this industry works is it revolves around the ability to access a large supply of bodies that are essentially free, that have nowhere nowhere to go, nowhere to rest. And what, what happens is uh, these are, you know, you've heard the term healthcare, folks. Think of the term death care. That that is an umbrella term encompassing every aspect of what happens when you have to uh, try to try to figure out how to move on with your life, try to figure out how to help uh, someone you love that has passed be put to rest in the manner of their choosing and respectfully. But and and we'll see this through some specific examples. Um, this hits this hits low income families really hard. You're desperate. Maybe you've had a, maybe you've had a relative or a parent or a child or a sibling who has struggled with chronic medical condition of one sort or another all their life. You've paid for multiple surgeries, right? You've paid for multiple treatments. And this is the US. So this is where the like the one of the top causes of bankruptcy is a medical disaster, right? So you have drained whatever resources you could access and unfortunately your loved one has passed away you cannot afford the often uh unexpectedly high cost of a funeral nor of a of a cremation and then someone comes along and they say you know you can donate your loved one's body to science we'll take care of the expenses and we will connect them with someone who will help make the world a better place for the generations to come after and then when they're done, when this operation is done, we will cremate the reme remains for you. We will give them to you free of charge. And it, isn't that something your loved one would have wanted to do to help other people? Are, are you saying there are like reps for these organizations that seek these situations out? Oh, yes. Yeah, man. Mm -hmm. and, and often it will be in the form of just a little slip of paper or a brochure that ends up at a, an actual funeral home. Not always, but sometimes at a funeral home as uh, an option C, right? Uh, burial, mm -hmm. cremation, or C. Right. And this, this all means that often due to the way health and death are priced in the United States, strange to say it that way, but it's not hyperbolic. This means that often... Families feel they have no choice other than accepting the help of a body broker. And that's where it leads us to controversy, corruption, conspiracy, crime, obviously inequality, huge part of this, no argument against it. 
But before we continue, I do think it's important to note that not all of these body brokers, these non-transplant tissue banks, are inherently sinister. This is a thing that needs to happen. Donated bodies are an essential role in training, education, research. This is why a lot of people aren't dead today, to be honest with you. I feel like we led with that for sure. I mean, the idea of this profession or this the need for these go-betweens is not inherently um, you know, malevolent. I mean, somebody has to act as the, you know, liaison between the families of the departed and where those bodies end up. And usually they're just satisfying the wishes of that person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and think about the good Ben's talking about. We, we mentioned it at the top a little bit. The cadavers, body parts, they're used by medical students all, all, all the time. Medical students, they need human bodies and sometimes just body parts to actually study the techniques, the, the, the techniques that they're learning in medical school so that they can apply them later. Uh, there's, I mean, there's so many different uses for, for a cadaver in the medical field that if you did not have them, we would be out of luck as humans. Mm -hmm. Like we mentioned surgeons, uh, we mentioned paramedics. You should also talk about, uh, how people come up with the idea of new surgical instruments. Mm -hmm. You you certainly wouldn't want to be having open heart surgery and then be the person who died on the table that helped the surgeon figure out, oh, there's a better widget for this. You would like <laughs> for that widget to already be there when it's time for you to go under the knife. So this does make sense. It, it teaches us about implants techniques that could be evolved, new medicines and treatment for disease, like serious stuff. So the need's there. And we know this practice does produce measurable, significant, very positive results for living people. The problem is there is so much stuff about this trade that we do not know, including people who are experts in studying it, like Ray Madoff is a Boston College Law School professor who studies the way that the legal system treats the remains of dead people. Yeah. And I mean, and if this guy is is open in the way that we're about to, to point out about what he doesn't know, I mean, I think that says a lot. He says, quote, we know very little about who is acquiring these bodies and what they are doing with them. Uh, and then back to the Reuters piece that we've been talking about, um, a journalist by the name of Brian Grow. He actually tried a little experiment where they contacted a broker in Tennessee and after just a few emails, they were able to buy a cervical spine and two human heads. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, yep. Um, ben, I want to go back really quickly to something you, you said a little while ago about surgical instruments. And one of those surgical instruments that, or, or let's say a class of surgical instruments that was developed through the use of bodies and, and testing on bodies was something like the saws that are used in surgeries, surgical saws, various types of bone saws and things like that. Specifically, saws that were designed to cut a human body open and cut it up, perhaps into parts or amputate uh, a limb or something like that. As part of that Reuters investigation, they found that those same, uh, those same tools that were developed for working on bodies are often too expensive for the companies that are being started by body brokers, the body broker, smaller companies. So they found that they had actually been using chainsaws to mm. cut up human bodies after they were donated to their companies. In, in at least one particularly grisly, at all. grisly case. Yeah. And that guy was also renting body parts out. Uh, yes. Uh, I also want to add, so another little piece of further digging I did is uh, you always want to try to go to the source of either side of an argument. So if you want to see people who are championing these tissue banks, you want to visit the American Association of Tissue Banks. And they have, they have, um, they break down the needs that we're describing, but they, I would argue, kind of gloss over some of the problems let's let's go back to this the idea <clears throat> that just if you're you may be just a few emails away from finding someone who says yes i can get you a spine 
I can get you a head. How many heads do you want? You know what I mean? And then you start talking <laughs> price breaks or whatever. But Grow being a journalist was horrified and I think heartbroken to learn the origin of one of these bodies. Uh, the the outfit that sold it to Restore Life USA uh, didn't know that they were selling this to a reporter. He found out the spine came from a young man named Cody Saunders, who had uh, the struggle that I described earlier. He died on his 24th birthday after a long battle with uh, congenital conditions, like a hole in his heart, longstanding kidney issues. This poor guy had gone through 66 surgeries, more than 1,700 rounds of dial dialysis. And again, you know, uh, the U.S. is a lot of things, but it is not good at healthcare, right? Like poverty is a big cause of death, especially if you look at preventative medicine in this country. Anyway, even if you're a relatively well-off family, this kind of medical expense can put you in a really tough spot. And the Saunders family didn't have the money for burial cremation when Cody passed away of a heart attack. Uh, so they thought the best course for them to help people, and they thought, you know, this is what our son would want too, was to donate his body to this outfit, Restore Life USA, which is a for-profit organization. The month after he died, Restore Life sold Cody Spine to Reuters for $300 plus shipping. That's all it took. And I, I always assumed, I guess, that, that it would be much more expensive. Later, uh, these same reporters would go on to buy those two heads from the same place. And they consulted experts. And they said, okay, look, here's what we got. You know what I mean? Here's what they went to people who would be in charge of ethically sourcing human body parts for medical institution and 201 everyone they that they asked each individual said this paperwork is crazy sloppy there's not a good chain of custody everything's wrong with this i don't know if i in my position at this school or at this university or at this uh institution i don't know if i could ethically accept this and that is only one example of what we found is a, is a very widespread process. Uh, I suggest we pause for a moment for a word from our sponsors and then dive deeper into the dilemmas because there are even more, unfortunately. This is, we're going to try to do some lighthearted episodes later. Folks. <laughs> 